All right, thank you for having me here to speak today, and thank you all, yes, um, for staying in the back row there. It's a big room. Come a little closer. He's waving for me from the back row. All right, let's go. So I have some disclosures. They're here. And I wanted to start with how exciting it is. Uh, I've been a psychiatrist working exclusively with patients with IBD for about 15 years now. And this is just my own straw poll of PubMed looking at uh, what the psychosocial research has done um, pre-2010 and then over the past five years. And I just randomly picked depression, psychotherapy, sleep, and anxiety stress. And to watch that our literature is increasing, the study sizes and study quality is getting better and better, and that the research is coming from many more places around the globe is a very exciting thing to see. So what I thought I would do for today's talk, however, in 20 minutes, is to summarize for you what's new in the last year or so in the areas of depression, anxiety, suicide, and sleep and fatigue, because I think as gastroenterologists, those are areas where you and your medical teams can make a difference. So depression and anxiety. One of the, I think, most well done reviews um, of anxiety, depression, and really the facts about the rates is just coming out now, and it's written by a group of what I would call the psychologist powerhouses in our field. So Makoka Wallace and Knowles are in Australia, um, Kiefer is here in the States, and Graf is in Canada, and so um, they put their thoughts and their collective wisdom together, and they did a literature search that was very well done, and I wanted to quickly summarize that in terms of what the rates are, um, and the rates illustrate what much of the previous literature has shown, but I think we can say in a very competent way, taking all the studies into effect. So in comparing patients with IBD with, to healthy controls, 13 studies, we have double the rate of anxiety and almost double the rate of depression compared to healthy controls. When we look at inactive versus active disease, um, we still have high rates in inactive disease, but the rates really escalate in patients that have current active disease when probed. Comparing ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, however, those are equal opportunity diseases, so the rates of both anxiety and depression are pretty similar and not statistically different. When we compare to other medical, chronic medical conditions, and they had some criteria for the study about the size and the types of studies included um, in those 17 studies, anxiety rates were the same across chronic disorders, and um, there are um, studies where there's higher rates of depression in other chronic diseases um, other than ours. Then the last category that they looked at, onset before or after IBD of anxiety and depression. For adults, anxiety and depression occurs prior to or can occur prior to your diagnosis of IBD. Depression had a very strong signal after. And for children, anxiety and depression at a clinically significant rate um, was much greater after the diagnosis of IBD. So again, I think it's just helpful to start with some grounding facts. A recent study just came out of Canada um, looking at the rate of generalized anxiety disorder. So that's the number one most common type of anxiety disorder. And it consists of chronic constant worrying along with body tension symptoms, so muscle tension, difficulty sleeping. And um, the key is that it's significant enough worrying that it's associated with functional impairment as well as avoidance of anxiety provoking activities or um, life functions. So they did, um, they looked at the nationally representative community, uh, Can Canadian Community Health Survey that consisted of 22,000 individuals, and they looked at the estimates of the odd ratios of those with and without IBD for meeting the diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD as we call it, and patients with IBD were twice as likely to have this and it was partially mediated by chronic pain and childhood adversity. 
Childhood adversity is described as anything that was overwhelmingly stressful during childhood. So it could be something as um, sort of what we would call simple and non-diagnostic as a, as a parental divorce, or it could be all the way to the extremes of physical sexual abuse. So um, when, we, when they looked at childhood adversity um, in terms of another study that looked at childhood um, adversity, physical and sexual abuse, and its association with IBD type, it was only found to be significantly correlated with ulcerative colitis, not Crohn's disease. One of the, what I thought, um, very interesting studies, and it even got a call out um, across medical journals, is a study for the use of group mindfulness for anxiety and depression. So this was done in 33 patients who got this treatment for their anxiety depression and 27 patients who just got treatment as usual, done by Nielsen and colleagues. What is mindfulness? Because we've all been hearing that term a lot. Mindfulness is an awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose, in the present, and non-unjudgmentally unfolding the experience moment by moment. So even if you notice your pain, you're teaching patients just to let it go, just to put their mind in a neutral place. If we take mindfulness or we take meditation and we ask patients to imagine something non-stressful, putting themselves on the beach, now we've added guided imagery, and guided imagery is a training wheel to get you in that state where you can just let the pain go. So in their study, they had, even with these relatively small samples, a significantly greater improvement in quality of life and anxiety after the in intervention. And very importantly, when they looked six months later, they still had a sustained improvement in that group. So something that we should all be thinking about, how can we get our patients access to these kinds of techniques that are now becoming available more and more in community settings, and even online programs that are very good. Now let's move on to uh, suicide rates. So this is a poster that um, we had here, um, our group at Pittsburgh, um, Dr. Al Hashash, is, has really taken on an interest in thinking about, well, what is the rate of suicidality, and that's thinking of suicide in patients, and how can we better predict it in our patients. So we found that out of the 1,300 or so consecutive patients we probed, 71 were suicidal, and so that's a 0.5% rate, and we've replicated that now over um, several samples. So this is taking all comers seen in our tertiary care medical center. Um, it was associated most predominantly with depressive severity. And we use the PHQ-9. Every single IBD patient gets the PHQ-9 at every GI appointment that they come to. And then we um, monitor those, and um, those patients that are suicidal get a call to come set up an appointment with us in our behavioral clinic. Um, incidentally, the follow-up for those calls is only 38%, so it's something that we're looking at. So even though we call them, they don't always come and follow up for those appointments, even with us. Um, what was also interesting in looking at the suicide, again, this is the severity of suicidality, is that it was much more associated with cognitive aspects of depression than what we call the somatic symptoms that we think about when patients have inflammation. So the rate, the um, Degree of suicidality did not associate significantly with fatigue, sleep, appetite changes, or inflammatory biomarkers like sed rate. Substance abuse, especially narcotics, and interestingly low-dose tricyclics, so um, that's a marker for chronic pain, and that's what we use it for in our clinic, was also associated with increased risk for suicidality. In a Danish study that um, was done in 2010, um, looking at 27,000 completed suicides, so this is a population study, they looked at the rates in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and those rates were higher when they were, when they were com um, compared to match controls. So again, I think it is a real signal and something that we now are learning in larger groups of patients that there are ways that we can be especially thoughtful in screening for suicidality um, in some of our higher risk patients. So let's move on to sleep and fatigue. 
a lot of activity in research. Um, and you see the studies, I, I could not in a 15 minute talk, um, cover in detail um, all of the authors that you see listed there on the bottom and that you have in your slide set, but I am going to summarize their work. Sleep disturbance now has been associated with both inactive and active disease. Um, IBD patients show especially problems in areas such as increased sleep latency, so that's the time it takes you to fall asleep, sleep fragmentation, increased tiredness, and reduced sleep quality high C-reactive protein, so uh, immune activity is associated with poor sleep quality. And um, in, in one study um, done by Dr. Rubin's group, um, it, they showed that the, this association was independent of nocturnal uh, GI symptoms. So sometimes we think that, oh, the patients that are having nocturnal diarrhea might be at higher risk. Some are, but as a group, the inflammation seems to be a much stronger driver. And then depression and sleep disturbance um, also in turn increase the risk of an IBD relapse. So again, another area where it's relatively easy to intervene with um, these kinds of sleep problems, and I'll tell you how in a moment. In another study um, that looked at 151,000 women followed um, through the nurse's health study, they found 100, they have 191 cases of Crohn's disease, 230 cases of ulcerative colitis. And this was interesting because they found that either sleep that was too short, less than six hours, or sleep that is too long, greater than nine hours, was associated with increased incident risk of ulcerative colitis, but not Crohn's disease. The national and actually the international sleep society's combined efforts and just this year came out with guidelines that all of us would benefit from seven to nine hours of sleep every night, but this is particularly important if you have chronic condition like IBD. Another interesting part of the study was that the shift work, so rotating night shift work, did not seem to um, have an increased risk of incident um, Crohn's or colitis. What about fatigue and IBD? So 40 to 44 percent of patients with inactive IBD complain of fatigue across multiple studies. Um, there is significantly higher than that rates of fatigue. It was high as 90 percent with active disease. In a study with 2,000 patients with IBD, depression, low quality of life, and female gender were correlated with fatigue. Um, if you, in another study that adjusted for disease activity, disease type, and age, uh, they found that being female, psychological distress, poor sleep, and ratings of reduced psychological well-being were um, independent predictors of fatigue over time. So again, we're seeing a lot of overlap of some of the same factors, and so the number one um, thing that you should look at past disease activity when you have uh, patients complain of fatigue is what their sleep habits and sleep hours are. So I was fortunate enough and am just completing a CCFA Senior Investigator Award to look at sleep and fatigue in adolescents and young adults um, age 15 to 30. And um, so far, we're, all, we're finished with recruitment in two months, but we've had screened 193 patients with Crohn's disease and 48% met criteria for both the sleep disturbance and fatigue. Um, we use self-report questionnaires that are validated, the PISCI for sleep and the MFI or um, multi-factor um, fatigue inventory for the fatigue. Um, they were mean age of 23 in the sample, slight predominance of female, and as a group had mild IBD activity. 57% were depressed. Um, 8%, I'm sorry, 24% were depressed, 57% were anxious, and 8% uh, met criteria for PTSD. Again, this is taking all comers in our clinics, screening them for sleep in their IBD appointments. Sleep disturbance and fatigue were significantly associated with higher uh, disease activity, and fatigue was associated with depression, anxiety, and being female, and not correlated in our study with disease activity. We um, designed a brief behavioral intervention specifically for patients with IBD. Um, this was taken from an insomnia behavioral intervention that one of my colleagues has at University of Pittsburgh. She designed it to treat 
sleep problems in veterans coming back from active combat and having PTSD. So I thought if it worked for those, that group of patients, that was a good starting point to modify for our patients. And um, it is um, two to four sessions. There's education about sleep hygiene. There's some behavioral strategies that I'll show you in a moment. And then for patients that are having trouble falling asleep or having multiple awakenings that also have an anxiety or a pain link, um, we do a one session hypnosis training and make a tape for them to listen to. So with that um, intervention, we've had 48 patients complete this open trial, and we've seen significant improvement in sleep, fatigue, their quality of life, anxiety, and depression over the three months. Basically, the behavioral part of the intervention is assessing that they're sleeping enough hours, and then lining up their sleep drive, so how tired are they when they go to sleep. That's a function both of how active you are during the day, you're gonna be more tired if you're more active, and what time you get up in the morning, and what kind of activities that you're doing before you try to fall asleep at night. And then we also look at their biological clock. So all of us work on 90-minute cycles when we're more awake and more sleepy, and that's primed by light-dark cycle. So um, we train them to align their sleep drive with their um, biological clock, and that's what their bedtime is. And then we set their wake time to be seven hours later, same time each day, seven days a week. Now, the interesting evolution in sleep medicine um, in general is this focus of moving away from um, sort of terming it sleep pathology and actually thinking about it as sleep health. And this automatically then makes it apply to all of us. So instead of thinking about sleep disorders like insomnia as diagnoses and treatment, really focusing on sleep characteristics and which characteristics of sleep um, we and our patients can improve. Thinking about it then not as a medical disease perspective and not as a categorical, either having a sleep disorder or not having, but again, um, making the treatment goal more positive, dimensional. Everybody has a degree of um, an issue with sleep health, if not on an ongoing basis, and at least intermittently. And again, what can we do to work on that aspect? Because it really has been shown everywhere from increasing life expectancy, but certainly in our patients, sleep is linked to less disease activity, or good sleep is. So in ending, um, this was a very rapid fire tour for you of, again, some of the latest um, things that are out there. And um, I think that we have to think about these um, categories that I covered, depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbance, and fatigue as being interrelated. And all of them being, um, you know, the more of these that you have going on, the higher risk of um, potentially feeling suicidal. And then if I had to identify some of those other targets that I think even as gastroenterologist, it's worth probing, um, especially if you have depression, anxiety, and significant sleep and fatigue that isn't just a deprivation going on, then it would be um, narcotic use, chronic pain, and childhood adversity. So thank you. <laughs>